Welcome to our fifth I'm session. I'm here with my good friend, Justin Meyer, who's going to welcome you to this session. Justin? <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the fifth session. Uh, we're glad that you've uh, decided to tune into uh, probably the most demanding and needy of our church planting <laughs> programs of <laughs> faculty. <laughs> and so we hope that you continue to enjoy this. We and have been if not, able to drive enrollment to three. Uh, with this, uh, with this, my goal is to get rid of all of you out there. All right. So, so enjoy the rest of the session and uh, keep up the good work. Know that we are praying for you. We care about you, and we hope to see God do great things in your life. Go ahead, Reggie. Wow, I didn't realize this was about God doing great things. I just thought this was an online seminary course. All right, now, I haven't. <laughs> but you know, I am, uh, I am glad you're here because without you. I have no idea what I would do. Now, uh, here is, uh, at the end of the last session, we were discussing this notion of God preparing us for life by giving us vision. Now, my very fine studio audience came up with some stunning questions uh, during the break that I think that are, we really need to trot out here in front of, of you uh, because you probably had some of these same questions. For instance, like, uh, just to make sure we get the connection with how do we see the box lid? If vision is such an important part of the box lid, it gives us some idea. And, and I want to say that all of that discussion about, you know, what our talent and uh, these clues of personality and, and passion and, and uh, personality are all clues, some clues to the box lid. They may not be all of the clues, but I would be paying attention. In fact, when God, when I say that God works with us in, in a preparation mode and, uh, and that he's at work in all five of these areas, don't, I, I know I have to talk about one thing one at a time, but don't mistake that as a linear idea that God is only working for us to get the vision then he'll move to values, then he'll move to results, then he'll move to, because he is working this all the way through our lives all the time and sometimes we're ahead in our knowledge in some areas to the other for instance I work with a lot of people who will come to me for coaching and they are clueless about this maybe and maybe they even have a big picture but they don't have the smaller next picture like what's the next chapter what are the rails that I can run the big picture on to get there uh, in this particular part of my life. I mean, most folks come for coaching that are trying to solve an idea, and often it will, it will relate around that. For instance, <clears throat> I had uh, one uh, leader come about a year ago, and we spent a day together, and we talked through some of the next chapter options in his life and what God was doing in his life uh, and, and how his role and notion of what it is to be a pastor and be church was changing. Well, instead of saying, well, that, you know, that's, un that's irrelevant to your role as pastor, we tried to incorporate that, uh, in, in fact have, and so he's, he's been able literally to move into pastoring a network of missional communities as opposed to the, the congregational pastor that he was uh, prior to that. You see, that's a way that you, you, you take you and your vision and, and let that kind of be the expression of your life instead of taking you and hammering you into someone else's vision for your life. Or say, taking you and, and hammering you into a job. Because that's what we do with most people. We take their dreams and we uh, we shrink wrap them or cut the edges off and form them and make sure that they fit some kind of a job. And uh, that's so demonic. In fact, every, in fact, hell is a very busy place, in case you don't know it. And, uh, and everyone there is doing someone else's vision. Uh, they're not motivated by their own vision. I mean, it's, it's, it's it, you know, because everyone there is having to conform uh, to some kind of uh, job specs. Uh, and, and, but God doesn't build leaders like that. He doesn't build people like that. Uh, God didn't make a garden, for instance, and then say, gosh, I've got to make some people to work this sucker. I mean, uh, God, 
created work to get people done. He didn't create people to get work done. And, and so you have a, a whole different notion about what the point of all this is. If life is the point, and I'll keep making that point maybe because it's so easy to forget, uh, this whole missional discipleship thing of, being, of being, becoming a person is the mission, is the point. And, and if that makes you uncomfortable or make you feel like, gosh, that seems kind of too humanistic or something, all I plead is, is all I can plead is God here. Because uh, the biblical witness and everything that God seems to be about seems to be about building people. People are built to last. Not organizations, not a, people are built to last. And uh, we're going to carry who we are into eternity. We're not going to lose who we are. We're literally going to be building on who we are through eternity. That's how important it is. And by the way, God could create a universe and then take a day off, uh, you know, in six days. But he set aside all eternity to work on people. So this is very labor intensive. And you are not, you, I don't know what your idea of heaven is. But the notion that you will have arrived and then it's a static way of being uh, for eternity, that hardly seems uh, humanly rewarding. Uh, and it doesn't seem to match up with what the scripture says, that we, eyes not seen, ears not heard, and neither has entered into our heart what God has prepared for those of us who love him. And so there's a, there's a whole notion of discovery that I think is at the heart of all of eternity, all of our lives, uh, even when our sojourn takes us beyond our earthly sojourn here. Uh, it, what is it, Aslan says in one of the movies or the books, that gives it, you know, the adventure is just beginning uh, at the point of uh, the crossover uh, into the next life. And so uh, I, I really think that, that, and I don't know where I am in, this, in the sentence, the run-on sentence that I now have, uh, that started about four minutes ago. Uh, but it has something to do with the fact that the, we don't come at this linearly. So if a person comes to me and says, I don't know this, then I may say to them, well, tell me what excites you here that when you accomplish it, you feel good about. Or tell me what your talent is that when you're doing that, people say you do very well. And it's often that we can take these clues and, and get some hints of that uh, next chapter or that, that big uh, puzzle piece. So the, the, the question in our interim between uh, times, while you were fooling around and doing life, we were in here discussing uh, the stuff that you really should be thinking about. And that was one of the questions. Another question that came up uh, that is, uh, I think, really good is corporate and, and individual vision and how these mesh. And since this is a seminary course, uh, after all, that means that many of you will be, again, having leadership responsibility uh, for whether it's a congregation or a small group or whatever else. And I just want to suggest something uh, for you to think about. And it's been my experience that our, our typical approaches to doing corporate vision will send like a steering group off uh, to, you know, to a retreat and we'll, we'll put them in a room and, and, and give them bread and water and seal up around the edges of the door and tell them you can't come out till you can craft some vision statement. And it's got to be 18 words or less and, and all this kind of formularization. And so they get to work in there and they, they wordsmith this sucker and they come out and this is magnificent vision statement. In fact, I go to some of these places to speak and consult and I'll see their vision statement and then I get there and I'm just wondering, have these folks ever seen this vision statement? Because it has nothing to do with the reality that I'm encountering on the ground. And that's typically what happens when you follow a planning mode, because you assign a group of people to, to create something. See, I don't think you create vision. I think you discover vision. And that's why uh, I suggest that you think about as a congregation leader, small group leader, whatever the culture is, as a leader in your home, that you, that you build vision from the other way around. Rather than starting at the corporate level, here's our vision for where we want to go. Come join us. This is why people, many people, are tiring of vision. They go to church. They are, their lives are beat up. They are whipped. They are expending their energies and just trying to stay alive. 
and they go and they hear some, you know, come help this church be successful when they are the church and the right order to me seems to be creating a culture that makes sure that their lives are effective and successful. So I really believe that a lot of the vision quest, uh, you know, can be carried out uh, by finding out what individuals uh, are. For instance, when I go into congregation for, um, for consulting, we will conduct what I call heart hope sessions. And we'll ask people things like, if spiritual renewal came, what would it look like? What would people be doing differently uh, if spiritual renewal? I, I, I use that because it's a neutral word. I don't always uh, use um, spiritual awakening, actually, is the word I use. If a spiritual awakening came, kingdom of God's too fraught with too many responsibilities. So I just use something that's outside of our experience, quite honestly, because no one alive in America has been through a spiritual awakening. Uh, and so it has to be some, and, and so it's a scenario building process. So they have to say, what would churches be doing differently? Congregations be doing differently? How would our communities be different? What would I be doing differently? What would be the impact of that on? And so I'm, I'm able from that to kind of catch people's dreams for their communities and dreams for their lives. And then it's easier to, to craft a corporate vision that releases that as opposed to crafting the corporate vision here and then taking church members and hammering them into something that makes that work. Uh, and, and so I'm just asking you to consider that. I hope I've raised more questions for you and uh, than, than you can answer right now because part of this journey is for you to discover your own sense of where you think vision plays and what, what role you are playing in helping people realize the vision in their lives. Personally, I think a corporate vision that is compelling frees people to, to their individual mission. It doesn't mean that there are not corporate expressions. I'm big on that and every congregation or organization that I coach, we come up with three to five initiatives that are corporate that allow people in uh, and, and, I'll, and for a big reason I'm fixing to uh, show you. But also, uh, but, but, but your value of people, speaking of values, that's the next thing. But you see, how you even go at visioning re reveals how you value people. Or do you just value people as resources to make sure the corporate stuff gets done? And, um, and so this, this, is a, this is a big issue for you uh, to think through. But in your own life, hopefully you're making progress on this, but if you're not, if you can't declare what, oh, and I will tell you one other thing about vision. Oftentimes, when I do conferences, I will have people say, I want you to turn to the next person next to you and declare your life mission. And there's generally a big old sucking sound in the room, uh, you know, as people are unable to do that. And I think that this is very problem very symptomatic of the problem of the North American church at having la less power because missional followers of Jesus at some level should be able to turn to the folks. If we're living intentional lives, which I believe is what abundant life is about, great intentionality, it's not about the American dream, it's not about us all lining up to the same thing, it's about intentionality. You know why you're on the planet and you're prosecuting that agenda. That's what gives people meaning and abundance and a sense of accomplishment and contribution. And so uh, if you can't say that to someone, then keep noodling on this until you're able to say, well, even if you have to give the caveat, I may not be right, I may not have it all together, but I believe it's boom. And once you're able to say that, wow, you can begin to order your life in a different way. Now, by the way, if I'm the devil, I don't want you to discover the purpose for your life. See, because that's how I keep you in chains. And that's how I keep you, uh, you know, uh, distracted. Uh, because that's one of the, you see, there, there, there are big enemies to vision and to mission. And uh, distracted and, and, and is, is one of them. And uh, it's the key of modern life. It's the key, it's, it's the key uh, challenge of, of, of modern existence is distraction. Now let's talk about a second, hearing no further objections from you or questions from anyone else, I want to talk about 
the, for the rest of our session, and, and, and our scorekeeper has decided that he's going to leave the room, so I have no idea uh, how long I have. Uh, and, uh, and so we're, this is just, we're free now. Uh, we, we, there, there's, there are no boundaries or parameters to our discussion. But if I were to discuss the second part of spiritual preparation, uh, it would be something uh, about values. Now, let me tell you what we tend to think values are. We tend to think values are our beliefs. Now, you know, I don't mind that, but that's a very inadequate sense of values. Because what you believe um, you know, may or may not be sure. Values, let me just say, values are behaviorally examined. What you do is what you believe. Everything else is just religious talk. And when I'm talking about values now, I'm not talking about core beliefs like God's a trinity. And, and I'm, I'm talking about the stuff that drives you and me. And you and I are going to have a set of core values that don't number in the dozens, but the, our core values, you know, half a dozen of these, uh, maybe, maybe a few more uh, right in there close behind, but I'm talking things like, you know, achievement or, or comfort, uh, security or risk, uh, uh, recognition, um, you know, material gain. I mean, the, or, or, I mean, and, and these can have plus side, and now, these aren't, evil in themselves, but until you know what your core values are, there's no way that you can go about changing them. Now, uh, and, and even if you want to. So the first thing is, how do we gain values recognition? How do, how do we knock the fuzzies off our talk and our thinking and actually determine what our true core values are? And I will suggest to you that if you don't know what they are, that you uh, right now hit the pause button and go ask your wife, go ask your, uh, your husband, your children, your best friends, your co-workers, go ask them what your core values are because they know what they are. Because you're living out your core values every single day. And so they can tell you, boom, just like that. Now, you may not like what you hear, but I'm not suggesting that you will automatically not, you may be very affirmed in what you hear. They may say things like, you know, you're compassionate uh, and merciful, and you may think, well, I don't feel compassionate or merciful because I have a war a lot of times. That's okay. How you're behaving is the stuff you truly are believing, and you need this kind of feedback. So uh, that, that is the first thing about determining what your core values are. Then you have to figure out where do we get these things. I mean, you are not born with your core values. I will tell you, you pick those up from a variety of sources. Now, obviously, our families of origin play a huge role in our core values. Uh, we first learn whether we were secure or not in our families of origin, whether we were blessed or not, whether we were loved or not. Uh, you know, all of that, we